I kind of lost track of time there. It's five after, so. Hopefully, I don't. I mean, if, if I go long winded like last time, you're hurting me in for a long night. <laughs> Everybody's like, <laughs> Well, uh, brother, uncle, you mind leading us in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, just thank you for this opportunity, dear Lord, to come to your house and that study your word. And God, we just uh, ask you to be with John as he leads her singing, and also, dear Lord, to, to bring your word to us here later on, dear Lord. Just be with him, strengthen him. Stand with him, fill him with your spirit, dear Lord. That you would uh, that deliver the words of God that you laid on his heart. Dear Lord, we just ask you to be with our pastor and his wife as they minister to those in Antioch. And God, I just pray, dear Lord, that the message you send in Gary, dear Lord, is for the church that they need to hear over there, dear Lord. And those that are, are in attendance, if any of them are lost, dear God, we just pray, dear Lord, that you'll come to know you before it's too late. Dear Lord, just thank you so much for this church. Thank you for our brothers and sisters here. And dear Lord, just be with those on our prayer list. Ask all these things, your precious and holy name. Amen. 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 All right, we'll grab your brown hymnal at 78, right? Right, Sister Pat? 89. 89. <laughs> <laughs> that was the third time she told me I still. Mm -hmm. Page 89.
page 27, all three verses. sister, dear Lord, in, in need and in pain, that her daughter is uh, is sick, dear Lord, and um, dear Lord, you, you know what's going on with her body, you're, you're the great physician, dear Lord, and I pray you just touch her body, dear Lord, heal her, and um, bring comfort to the, the whole family, dear Lord, be with the, the doctors and the nurses as they run the tests and try to figure out what's going on, dear Lord, I pray you just reveal it to them, dear Lord, exactly what the problem is, and that they're able to treat it, dear Lord, and we just pray that your will be done and that uh, we're all drawn closer to you because of this. We love and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Right. What you got? 125. 125. Page 125. Jesus paid it all. Sing the first, second, and fourth.
want to say praise the Lord and, and thank everybody. And you know what? A few weeks ago, my granddaughter had, had that wreck. And uh, we was down there Friday for, she got a ring for college and everything there. And she's just about healed up. She got her, she had a car, or SUV, and, you know, it got towed there. And so she always wanted a pickup. She got her new pickup. So she's, <laughs> she's in hog heaven. Thank y'all. James said we have three young deacons. <laughs> Get the right, Brother James. Right. Just how old you feel. That's right. Page 78. Page 78. I guarantee you it's nothing that, that we've done. It's what you know, God and Jesus has you know, stated. We, we wouldn't be able to do without Him, that's for sure. If it wasn't for Him, I, I wouldn't be up here, I promise you. <laughs> I give him all the praise and all the glory for that. Page 78, right? <laughs>
pastor, um, he, you know, I didn't realize this was his first revival. So um, he's out there, and um, we all just pray that that God revives that church. You know, <coughs> using him as a vessel. So you know, just um, you know, keep him in your prayers. Um, and I think that was about it on that. <laughs> Okay. We need to uh, remember Floyd. We and need to remember Randy because they're having procedures done this week. Mm -hmm. this week. Mm -hmm. I think Randy's this week. Yeah. Randy's next week. This week, week and what's next week? Mm -hmm. yes. yes, indeed. You know, thank God for Brother Randy uh, this morning as he, he brought the Lord's uh, word to us. And, um, and I'm going to attempt to do it tonight, so you know, kind of keep me in your prayers as well. Um, uh, you know, come up with a title for this uh, message. You know, on my way to work every morning, I have about a 30 minute commute uh, to and from work. So it gives me an opportunity to, you know, listen to the radio and get in, get into God's Word through, through preaching, you know, the, the, the foolish preaching, I guess, what the Bible says. But um, in the morning, I listen to Brother uh, Steph Martin. He is, he's a retired pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in Shreveport. He's, He's kind of a hellfire brimstone preacher, you know, and I listen to him in the mornings from 7 to 7.30, so it's perfect. You know, I get to catch him on the way to work. I listen to uh, Brother Jeff, <coughs> Jeff Shreve over here at First, uh, First Baptist Texture County. He's, he's a little bit more laid back, more, most, more subtle, and so it's kind of like sunny here at Lake Country. In the morning, you got Lake, you got hellfire and brimstone, and in the evening, you got a little bit more subtle. It's more of a, you know, teaching Less a sermon than it is Hellfire and Brimstone. So, kind of get the best of both worlds listening to them on the radio. And, you know, it's good to, to, to try to get as much as God's Word as you can in every day. I mean, you can read the Bible through and through every day for little to be a hundred and still, you know, not get everything you need to get out of it. So, every time you read it, like we were talking in Sunday school this morning, it, it's something different. You know, one verse can have, can touch people in so many different ways. So it's good to just keep reading it and keep persevering. Um, but uh, Brother Jeff Shreve was preaching on faith versus works, and I kind of felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit to, to preach on that, so to do a little bit more research into that. Um, so I guess my title is Faith versus Works, but I researched it to the point to where it's, it's kind of really just faith. So as you all will see as we go along through the the sermon here that it is just all about faith and, and works is all part of it too but it's not really one versus the other but so I guess the title would be faith versus work but you can capitalize all the letters in faith so all right <coughs> and all my notes they're just you are see them I got arrows pointing which way I don't really have everything in order so hopefully the Holy Spirit will, will put it out to you guys to where where you know he would want you to hear it and where you get better understanding of it. Um, we'll turn to uh, to Galatians two and sixteen. Says, uh, know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, so we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ, and not by observing the law, because observing the law, no one will be justified. So what Paul's basically saying here is that we're not justified by our works, but we're justified by, through faith. Um, you know, Justification or being justified is kind of being free of, or um, see, I wrote the definition. It's absolute or declared free of. So, what he's saying here is that, you know, we're justified through faith. And um, when you look at faith, I mean, what, what, what would y'all say faith is? Is it just believing? You say faith. That's kind of what I think of when I think of faith is. Is believing, or um, and what 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 do you believe in that that Christ is the Son of God, that He rose from the dead? You know, all that is definitely definitely needed in our faith, and that's what kind 
kind of faith is what, what it's based on. But as I, I looked at it even deeper, um, let's see. Yeah, you want to believe that God exists. He's the Son of God. Um, so let's turn to uh, Luke 7, Luke chapter 7 and verse 44. Now, what's going on at, uh, before we read this verse here, what's kind of happening is that um, there's a Pharisee named Simon. And, uh, of course, you know, Simon, he's a believer of God, you know, the God of Abraham and Isaac. And he, um, he wants to invite Jesus to his house to eat. <coughs> so I'm in the wrong chapter here. Hang on. So he wants to invite him to the house to eat, and so so Jesus comes to his house, and they're they're eating, and um, as they're eating, a uh, a, a very sinful woman uh, kind of barged in, you know, uninvited, and she tears in her eyes. She begins to use her tears to wash Jesus' feet, and um, she she dries his feet with her hair, and she uses a real expensive perfume of an expensive bottle. She breaks and covers his feet in perfume, and. Uh, while she's doing this, this is kind of after they, they got finished eating. They're probably sitting in the living room. Jesus' feet are, feet are propped up, and, you know, this gave her an opportunity to do that. And while she's doing that, Simon just kind of like, you know, do you realize who this woman is who's touching your feet? He's kind of like looking down on her because he knows uh, how sinful she is. And um, it kind of, you know, Jesus even said that with Simon, he was a little... Like, he wasn't really inviting, you know, he was just kind of, he wasn't, I guess, not a very really good host to, to Jesus as he entered into his house. Uh, but this woman came and so, and did what she did, and then Jesus says in verse 44, Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved me much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. So, we were talking about faith earlier. It's not, yes, it is all that was good. We said it's believing who Jesus is, what he's done for us, but also, in her essence, she surrendered to Christ. Um, and that's kind of one thing I was missing, you know, when I was thinking about faith is, is being surrendered to Christ. Um, just being like she was. I mean, she couldn't stop kissing his feet, you know. Um, so, that kind of took a little bit off the subject of what God was saying, but I mean, what Paul was saying earlier, but um, I just want to talk about faith a little bit there. Um, what Paul was saying is that, you know, we're justified by faith and not by works. So when it, we say we're not justified by faith, we're, we are justified by faith and not by works, we're at least talking about the Mosaic Law, which I think that was a lot of the, that what was going on with Paul and, say, with James is... They were, uh, uh, especially with Paul, he, he would get kind of angry with Peter because Peter would still want to circumcise and do things of the law. And he's like, if you're doing one thing of the law, you must obey the whole entire law. You can't just, you know, because God says if you, if you break one portion of the law, you break the whole law. So if you're trying to do one portion of the law, you need to do the whole law. But if you're, if you're going by the law, then everything that Christ has done is in vain, you know. So... He would kind of have to put Peter in his place sometimes with that. Um, 
So I think, you know, that's what he was kind of saying here. We're just about by faith and not by works. It's the Mosaic law, of course, is what they're talking about, but also um, the works that we do on our own strength, um, which Paul knows a lot about, you know, on the, you know, before, before he became into this ministry when he was Simon from, where was he from? <laughs> Um, anyway, on the road to Damascus, you know, he ran into Jesus there, and Jesus blinded him. Uh, I mean, have y'all ever been blind, blindsided by Jesus in life? Uh, um, not literally blinded, but, you know, loss of a loved one or, um, you know, uh, injury to your leg for an ACL or, you know, something that kind of slows you down, uh, makes you really get closer to God. So, Simon, before... He met Jesus. He was really into the Mosaic Law and doing it all on his own to the point to where he's persecuting Christians and you know going against Jesus. So when he met Jesus, he found out that he cannot do any of this without without Christ. He explains it. Uh, Paul explains it in Romans seven. So we'll turn back to Romans. 7 and 14 through 24. It says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. So does a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, and if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. Know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For, my, for in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a, a slave to the law of sin. So he's, he's basically laying it down, and that's, that's pretty much not, I mean, that's what he's saying with him, but that's, that's all of us right there, uh, from what Paul's saying. So, and then also in Romans 3, chapter 10 and 20, there's a couple of lengthy readings here, but it, it kind of gets down to it. So, three, uh, chapter 3, verse 10 through 20 says, And it is written, There is no righteousness, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves, their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways, and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. So what they're saying is the, the law... In which it says here in 20, 
Verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. So the law wasn't put in place to condemn us. It was put in place to, to let us know what sin is and make us become conscious of sin and realize that no one can be truly perfect with this law. You know? It's like we were saying earlier, if you, if you break one piece of law, you break the whole law. So you can take everybody in this world and just throw out the Ten Commandments to them. You know, just that's just one part of the law, the Ten Commandments. And there's, you know, right then and there, like it says in uh, verse 19, that every mouth will be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Um, so, you know, you could ask someone, you know, you think you're going to go to heaven? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I don't really, you know... I'm a pretty good person. I don't do drugs or, you know, drink. I, I think I'll get into heaven. And, and you can just start listening down to the Ten Commandments. And it's like, well, okay, well, I didn't obey my mom, my mom that well. I was, you know, it's, so everybody is, it's, they, they start feeling guilty. And it's because we're all guilty is what Christ says. There's, there's not even one person. The only person that was perfect was Jesus Christ. And thank God for Him. It says that, um, so, in the end, because we're all guilty, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. Because, you know, we're not all perfect and, and everyone is a sinner. So none of us on our own or by our own merits can ever do enough to earn God's grace. So, what's great about all this, though, I mean, as wretched as we are, God has fixed this problem for us. Hallelujah. Amen. So in Romans uh, 3, chapter 3, and 21 through 25, it says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from law, <coughs> has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in His blood. He did this to demonstrate His justice because of His forbearance and He had left the sins committed beforehand uh, unpunished. So... And if I, so do we nullify the law of this faith? And Paul says, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So God offers us grace as a free, undeserved gift in response to the sacrifice of Christ, His Son. That's what grace means. It's, uh, it's a free, undeserved gift. So through Christ. By accepting this gift of grace, we become pleasing to God, reconciled to Him, not by our own efforts, but by the cross of Christ. We receive this gift through the act of faith. So you notice that it says the act of faith. So what we're realizing here is that faith is actually becoming alive. Um, so when you say faith versus works, you can actually just intertwine them. Is your faith works? You know, if you're, if you want to take a take a look at your your, your faith, and, and I mean, are you uh, are you surrendered to Jesus? You know, you know, of course we are here. We believe, you know, that Christ is the Son of God. Are we are we truly surrendered to Him? And our the true faith being surrendered to God allows Jesus' love to work through us. So. James, um, see, uh, Jesus, is, his love will work through us, and he gives us the strength to do what we can never do on our own, such as me up here preaching. <laughs> um, even to love like he loves, making our faith active and alive. So if we look at the world and look at others like Jesus does, then our faith becomes alive. It's, a, it's actually an active thing. It's like this, like... Brother Randy was preaching on this morning that this book, the Word of God, is alive. And that's just how our faith should be. Our faith 
It's not that, well, I'm, I'm, I'm saved by faith and faith alone. Yeah, you're saved by faith and faith alone. You know, what exactly is faith? Is your faith alive? You know, is it, is it, are you putting yourself in the back corner and letting Christ be in the forefront and, and His love, you know, shining through you and, and, and having that true faith and it, you have evidence of it by, by having Jesus' love, you know, just shine through you. So in James uh, chapter 2, 18 through 26, I think I'd have these marked. <laughs> I had some on mark, but they're marked in the wrong spot. James chapter 2, 18 through 26. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there is no, no, you believe there is one God, good. Even the demons believe. You know, we were talking about earlier with our faith. You know, of course we believe, it. even the demons believe. You foolish man, you want, you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. You see that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. This is the NIV. This is my study Bible. But um, so he's basically saying that um, that person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. We we're talking about earlier. Earlier, you look at just just being justified, uh, and what I'm learning with the Bible, um, pretty much every word and you go in the dictionary, every word has more than one meaning. You know, most words have at least two meanings, if not four, five, six. Uh, with justify, we said earlier, is to be absolute or declare free of. And I think what James is referring to with when he's saying we're justified um, by what we do, not by our faith, is the which is the second meaning of justified is to demonstrate or prove. So what he's saying is you are proving your faith through your works. You are demonstrating or showing evidence of it by justifying being justified by your works and not your faith. So we are justified by faith, the faith that and, it, and we're justified by faith if we're talking about the faith that says yes to grace and causes us to walk in, in Christ's ways. Faith, faith is our, our cause, our justification, and works is the effects. So you have your, your cause of everything, which is your faith. And if you have that true faith, the, the faith that says yes to grace and causes you to walk in God's ways, then your effects will be your works. So, you know, a man... You can look at a man and, and see by the fruit that he bears, you know, and the fruit of the Spirit. And our works are evidence of our faith and salvation. So faith and works go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. They're actually together as one. It's kind of like the, the, it's the Son and the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you know. They're all, they're all one. It's just like faith and works. Instead of comparing to the two, you have the two together. So, um, so I'm actually finishing a little early, but I'm gonna I'm gonna leave y'all with this uh, with this scripture, this last scripture. And I was hoping, you know, Dad usually has picks people to, to you know read scriptures. I know there's always one very very eager person that's usually wanting to read a scripture. So I was kind of hoping that she would uh read this scripture out to us to kind of leave us with this this great scripture if she will Iris Which scripture is it? 
Um, if she wants to come up here, I can let her read it from the microphone. That would be great. What scripture is it on? It is Titus 3, 4, and 8. Chapter 3, verses 4. We'll read all the way to 8. Okay. It'll stop. Uh, it'll stop over here. Okay. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, but not because of righteousness, the thing we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, but we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saving, and I want you to stress these things so that those who have trust in God may be careful. Um, to devote devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and prof profitable. profitable for everyone. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, did y'all get that last verse off? You're looking in your Bible and reading with her. Um, so that that's a good scripture to, to end it with and to leave y'all with. But um, just know that you know. I, uh, last time I preached, I uh, you know I had to confess I, I used a lot of the internet to kind of help lead me in certain ways. And it, internet's a great tool. You know, it's like using the dictionary. I mean, okay, what does this word mean? You can just Google it. You know, well. That big storm came through Friday and left us out with no Wi-Fi, no internet. So I was thanking Jesus for it. I was like, "All right, I get to get here and get deep in the Word, the old-fashioned way." And I, I got to reading the book, and I, you know, Jessica had to go to work. She picked Lana up and um, went to her mom's, and she called me. It was like what three o'clock, and she she was like, "Well, how's it going?" I was like, "It's going pretty good." So I'll probably wait till the night and get everything wrote down. She was like, "You haven't wrote nothing down yet?" <laughs> like, "No, no." So. Uh, so it was a lot of reading. So I, I really encourage y'all to to get your Bibles. You know, uh, Romans is excellent. I, I read all the Romans, um, Galatians, James. Um, they all really speak of, of faith. And um, yeah, a lot of people like to argue and debate on that faith works. What's right? You know, a lot of Catholics say you got to do this, this, and that. Or um, it's it's all the same. You know, if you're if you have true faith. And your your works will will show evidence of that faith. Amen. So so I just uh, want everybody to kind of reflect on that tonight. Uh, really take a look at your faith, um, and and just see if not only are you believing, you know, like like I said in the in the Bible, you know, even the demons believe. But uh, are you truly surrendered to God? Are you surrendering everything? You're all in all to Christ, and let Him. Do the works, you know. The works that are evidence our faith is because of Christ and His works, what He's working through you. So, um, Melissa, if you want to play a I Surrender All, that'd be great. So, y'all just be in prayer. Uh, if you want to get your, you know, like I say, reflect on yourself and your faith and you know, talk to Jesus about it. And if you want to come to the altars and, and get your faith down, set, set in stone, and if you're questioning your faith, I mean, um, we'll get that nailed down too. So, um, so please take this time as she plays I Surrender All. And
pray and even sing that song too in your hand. That's a wonderful song for this. Thank you. 